All right, hello everyone. We're about to get started. The Board for International Food and Agricultural Development and the U.S. Agency for International Development would like to welcome you to today's webinar to kick off a three-day Ag Exchange online discussion on food security research investments. This webinar will run for about an hour and will provide an introduction to the Ag Exchange and to the U.S. government's global food security strategy. My name is Julie McCarty and I am with the USAID Bureau for Food Security and I'll be facilitating today's webinar and also supporting the online discussion on AgriLinks. Before we get underway, I would like to just point out a few key features of the webinar room. I see that many of you have already used the chat box, which is great. This is your main way to communicate with us today. So please feel free to introduce yourselves, let us know what city and org you're joining from, share your thoughts and ask questions in the chat box. On the left of your screen, you will see a file downloads box, which contains useful pre-reading materials for the various discussion themes under the Ag Exchange. In particular, we recommend that you read the short framing papers for the particular discussion themes to which you plan to contribute. All of these documents are also posted in the resources section of the Ag Exchange uh, platform on AgriLinks, which I'll show you a bit later. And lastly, this webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be posted later today within the Ag Exchange platform. All right, so here is the agenda for our next hour. First up, we will have some video remarks from Brady Deaton, Chair of BIFAD and Chancellor Emeritus of the University of Missouri, fired, followed by video remarks from Ann Bartuska, Acting Chief Scientist and Undersecretary of the Research, Education, and Economics Mission Area at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. After that, Sahara Moon Chapatin, Deputy Assistant to the Administrator in USA's Bureau for Food Security, will frame the online discussion with an overview of the U.S. government's new global food security strategy. And our final speaker will be Robert Bertram, Chief Scientist of the Bureau for Food Security at USAID, who will zone in on the process of creating a research strategy for the GFSS and the various sub-themes on which we're seeking public input over the next three days. Finally, I will provide a few tips on how to join the Ag Exchange, and then we'll take a few questions from the audience. Uh, please note that we're aiming to keep this webinar brief so that we can dive into the online discussion. So we'll mainly focus on clarifying questions regarding uh, the global food security strategy or the process we're going through. And we'll encourage you to save substantive questions and comments on research for the Ag Exchange itself. Okay, we're ready to uh, get going and share some recorded opening remarks from BIFAD Chair Brady Deaton. We'll be playing this video within the webinar platform. Uh, but if you're having any technical difficulties viewing the video, we'll also share a YouTube link in the chat box and encourage you to watch it there. All right, so we'll go ahead with some opening remarks from Brady. The Board for International Food and Agricultural Development, or BIFAD. I'm very pleased to welcome all participants to this three-day Ag Exchange on aligning relevant U.S. government research investments with the U.S. Government Global Food Security Strategy of USAID, developed in response to the Global Food Security Act passed by the U.S. Congress last year. The BIFAD and the United States Agency for International Development are excited to be hosting this online dialogue with the international development and food security research communities around the world to inform the alignment of relevant U.S. government research investments with the new Global Food Security Strategy. Your input over the next three days will be extremely helpful in this alignment process as we seek strategies that guide relevant U.S. government research investments to most effectively support global food security. I'm here representing BIFAD, a presidentially appointed federal advisory committee to the U.S. Agency for International Development, established in 1975 under Title 12 of the Foreign Assistance Act, as amended. BIFAD's purpose is to advise USAID on ways that it can leverage the formidable research and educational assets of U.S. universities to help the agency achieve its goals for agricultural development, broadly defined. BIFAD is a strong advocate for the importance of research in shaping the development of and application of technologies and critical decisions that support the fight against world hunger and poverty. The operation of BIFAD is governed by the Federal Advisory Committee Act, or FACA, which emphasizes public involvement through open meetings, such as this online ag exchange, on priority issues of interest to the agency, 
in accordance with BIFAD's mandate. BIFAD also commissions reports, convenes conferences and workshops as needed on topics of interest to the agency. I'm joined this week by several members of BIFAD who will be participating in the discussion over the next few days. These include Dr. Pamela Anderson, former Director General of the International Potato Center, Dr. Carrie Fowler, Executive Director of the Global Crop Diversity Trust, and Dr. Gabisa Ejeda, Professor of Agronomy at Purdue University and World Food Prize Laureate. Other members of the board who could not be with us this week are Chancellor Harold Martin of North Carolina A&T University, James Ash, attorney with the Bush Blackwell Law Firm in Kansas City, and for President Wadet Cruzado of Montana State University. The three-day event will frame a research agenda around the themes described in the results framework of the Global Food Security Strategy, with emphasis on the strategy's three objectives. First, inclusive and sustainable agriculture-led economic growth. Second, a well-nourished population, especially among women and children. And third, strengthened resilience among people and systems. I'm excited to kick off the event with a webinar that incorporates participation from interagency partners in global food security, USAID and USDA. Dr. Ann Bartuska, Acting Under Secretary for Research, Education, and Economics and Acting Chief Scientist at USDA, will give opening remarks, followed by Dr. Sahara Moon Shapatan, Deputy Assistant Administrator in the Bureau for Food Security, USAID, and Dr. Rob Bertram, Chief Scientist of the Bureau for Food Security at USAID. These presentations will be served, saved on AgriLinks for those of you who wish to hear them later. Following the webinar, we'll go into an online session on prioritization of research investments in order to frame the discussion. And then, over the next three days, we'll address the themes of nutrition, agriculture-led economic growth, and resilience in that order. Finally, on April 20, day three of the Ag Exchange, BIFED members and I will come back together with U.S. government leadership for a live webinar from 3.30 to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time in order to summarize the key takeaways and to share insights and reflections. The formal moderation will end at that time, but if you didn't have time to engage and would like to post a comment, the Ag Exchange will be open for an additional day closing at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Friday, April 21. I encourage everyone to review the framing papers and accompanying slides and audio available on the AgriLinks website. These materials will help to frame and inform our discussions over the next three days. The full text of online discussion will be available here on AgriLinks, and minutes of this meeting will include a description of the matters discussed and any conclusions reached by BIFAD. Again, a warm welcome to everyone, and we look forward to your active participation in the Ag Exchange. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where in the world you may be. My name is Ann Bartuska, and I am the Acting Chief Scientist and Acting Undersecretary for Research, Education, and Economics at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. USDA has long partnered with USAID in planning and implementing global food security programming and approaches in recent years, largely through the Feed the Future initiative and now through the U.S. Global Food Security Strategy. It is my pleasure to welcome you here today at the start of this three-day e-consultation, hosted by USAID's Bureau for Food Security and the Board for International Food and Agriculture Development. USDA contributes to global food security and nutrition through its international food assistance, international capacity building and development programs, basic and applied research programs, data and information sharing, and the promotion of science-based policies and regulations that expand agricultural markets and trade. With offices at more than 90 U.S. embassies, USDA has a long institutional history of collaborating with foreign governments, multilateral organizations, non-government partners, and other stakeholders to achieve food security goals. The Research Education and Economics Mission Area, which I lead, brings together USDA's pro research programs, the Agricultural Research Service, Economic Research Service, 
National Ag Statistics Service, and USDA's extramural program, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. These agencies conduct and support diverse scientific research and technology developments relevant to food security, from developing improved cereal varieties to examining how food prices impact diet and nutrition. Within the U.S. government, we have begun the process of exploring how to implement the U.S. Global Food Security Strategy, GFSS as we all know it, and how our existing approaches can or should evolve based on years of experience with the Feed the Future initiative, changing conditions in field, and new research findings. Part of this discerning process involves revisiting the 2011 Feed the Future research strategy and updating it to better complement the GFSS. USDA was proud to partner with USAID and other agencies in the design of that original research strategy, and we have made great progress in many areas. It is our pleasure once again to support development of an updated research strategy that leverages U.S. government investments, infrastructure, and technical capacity to address critical knowledge gaps in pursuit of global food security a strategy that recognizes opportunities to work with and build on the tremendous achievement of key players outside of government, in the private sector, and in our many universities. This e-consultation is an essential step in addressing stakeholder needs. During this process, it is important that we hear diverse views from individuals and organizations around the world who may have different perspectives on where research can best contribute to breakthroughs and successes in agricultural-led economic growth, resilience of people and systems, and good nutrition. Thank you for joining in these important conversations. We look forward to seeing where the discussions may lead and to ensuring that the newly refreshed research strategy focuses our efforts on asking the right questions that will lead to meeting the needs of GFSS beneficiaries. I wish you all luck in the next three days. Thank you. Wonderful, and a special thanks to both Brady and Anne for helping us pre-record those video messages. All right, I'm going to go ahead and pass the microphone over to Sahara Moon Chapatin, Deputy Assistant to the Administrator in USAID's Bureau for Food Security, uh, for her introduction to the Global Food Security Strategy. To the Global Food Security Strategy, in July of 2016, Congress passed the landmark Global Food Security Act of 2016. It was passed with broad bipartisan majority. It institutionalized the Feed the Future approach to improving food security and nutrition. And it required us to develop a whole of government five-year global food security strategy. We had 10 short weeks last summer in which to develop the strategy. The 11 Feed the Future agencies and departments came together and jointly drafted and developed the overall strategy. We held a series of external consultations with key non-governmental and private sector stakeholders, including many of you who are currently on the line joined us in those consultations and gave us very valuable feedback and reflections. We also underwent a series of learning and analysis um, exercises over the, the year preceding that. We had some internal reflection and learning. We commissioned the Feed the Future Global Performance Evaluation. We held a series of roundtables on emerging issues, and we conducted numerous other evaluations on our programs. The strategy itself covers fiscal year 2017 through fiscal year 2021. In addition to the main body of the strategy, which I will talk about here, it includes a series of implementation plans, one from each individual agency and department that outlines the financial, technical, and in-kind contributions to the strategy for the first year, for fiscal year 17. And so the strategy then builds on our experience under Feed the Future to date. It reflects the learning and analysis I mentioned, and it also reflects changes in the global context since the initiative started several years ago. Here on the slide is our new results framework that we developed for the global food security strategy. It's quite small, so I'm told if you click on the four arrows above the slide, you can put it on full screen and might have a better chance of reading it. We're also going to try to make this results framework available to you in the resource section after the presentation if you'd like to go back and look at it. 
But this maps out effectively how we would like to achieve results leading to our overall goal for the new global food security strategy, which is to sustainably reduce global hunger, malnutrition, and poverty. We aim to do that by accomplishing the three objectives laid out here. The first is inclusive and sustainable agricultural-led growth. The second is strengthened resilience among people and systems. And the third is a well-nourished population, especially among women and children. Contributing to these three objectives, we aim to achieve a number of intermediate results. Those are the rectangular boxes under the objectives. And below that, we have a series of cross-cutting intermediate results that we feel are essential to accomplishing all the objectives. We also acknowledge the complementary results that the other development sectors are achieving, which are necessary for our success. These include things like um, a reduced burden of disease, economic growth in complementary sectors, healthy ecosystems and biodiversity, well-educated populations, and stable democratic societies. Our next slide, which I'm, I'm not going to go through here because there's a lot of information, but for what, if and when you, you choose to go back to review this, we've outlined some of the illustrative activities that are the building blocks to achieving our goals. So this gives you a flavor for what we mean by each of the objectives and the, the intermediate results that contribute to our overall goal. So to summarize what you saw on the results framework slide, we, we started our process developing the strategy by developing this updated results framework. And we use that to drive the overall strategy development process. As I noted, our overarching goal is to sustainably reduce global hunger, malnutrition, and poverty. For those of you who may remember the old Feed the Future results framework, it's consistent with the current Feed the Future goal. However, it elevates malnutrition into the goal statement, which brings it into alignment with both SDG 2 and the Global Food Security Act itself. And then, as I noted, we have the three objectives. These are three mutually reinforcing and interdependent objectives to achieve this goal, two of which were similar to the current Feed the Future results framework, the inclusive ag-led economic growth and the well-nourished population. However, we've re elevated resilience as a third objective, recognizing its importance to contributing to our overall goal. So what's new in the global food security strategy? And I should say, I'm going to call this new here, but these are really things we've been doing all along, but I think we've really elevated them and made them very explicit in the global food security strategy. In many cases, based on the learning that we have done over the last several years, recognizing the importance of these elements that I'm going to describe to achieving our overall goal. So I mentioned, um, so we've elevated malnutrition into the goal statement. We've elevated resilience as a third objective next to agriculture and nutrition. We've really doubled down on a holistic nutrition approach. Nutrition, of course, has been important to Feed the Future since the very beginning. But we're explicitly including WASH, the water, sanitation, and hygiene interventions, recognizing the importance that they have in contributing to our holistic nutrition approach. We are explicitly taking a systems approach throughout our programming to prioritize facilitation and work throughout value chains and supporting systems. For example, the policy interventions. Again, this is something we have been doing, but we are doubling down on it and really recognizing that to be successful, we will need to be successful at the systems approach as well. We are continuing to try to break down silos across sectors, and in particular between the development and humanitarian assistance. We recognize that there are different pathways out of poverty for different populations of people. And we need to recognize those different pathways and program accordingly. We recognize we also need to strengthen rural urban linkages to be successful. We have a new dedicated intermediate result on youth. And when I mention we have a new intermediate result, what that really means is that we are now holding ourselves accountable to measure our progress in that area. We also have one on finance investment and financial inclusion, recognizing how important financial services are to achieving our overarching goal. We, of course, are continuing many of our areas of focus and continuing to emphasize their importance in our work. We will continue our focus on high-impact interventions. We will prioritize evidence-based interventions that are designed to deliver impact at scale. We will continue to prioritize gender 
and female empowerment. It now is a dedicated intermediate result, which as I said, commits us to measuring progress against it. We will continue to emphasize country-led and local ownership. We feel these are at the heart of our approach for sustainability. Policy and governance continue to be very important. They are now an intermediate, a dedicated intermediate result. I like to highlight land tenure and the importance of it to achieving our overall goals. It figures actually in a few places within the global food security strategy and was mentioned in the Global Food Security Act. Capacity building continues to be important, looking at human, organizational, and system performance, again, as its own new intermediate result. We continue to emphasize natural resource management approaches. We are paying more attention to the role of fisheries in food security. And underlying all our work, of course, are the partnerships with governments, the private sector, civil society, the research, and the university community, without which we could not accomplish our objectives. And then finally, speaking to the topic of our discussion today, we will continue to harness the power of research, science, technology, and innovation to advancing our overall goal. So research supports the global food security strategy in so many ways. It, of course, there was a lot of research that contributed to our developing the global context and the lessons learned within the strategy. Research outputs and outcomes contribute, we feel, to all the intermediate results and objectives, which is why you don't see a dedicated intermediate result to research. We felt that it was so necessary throughout all the work we do that it is really integrated throughout. More broadly, science, technology, and innovation, of course, are also integrated throughout our strategy. They are essential to addressing some of the most critical food security and nutrition issues. They deliver a spectrum of innovations that our development partners at the private sector and other players in the countries where we work can use to integrate into their programming and advance our overarching goal. They deliver widespread impacts, both within and beyond our target countries, truly a global um, series of outputs. They are essential to strong gender integration. Through our work in science, technology, and innovation, we can build capacity for agriculture and nutrition research. We also recognize that in order to accomplish our objectives and see if we are accomplishing our objectives, we need unique measurement approaches, and science and technology can play an important role there as well. And then, of course, there's the feedback loop. As we generate new technologies and learning through our research efforts, we must focus on ensuring that those technologies are taken up by farmers, by others in the value chain, and that they are relevant to everyone uh, where we work in developing countries. We accomplish these goals through extensive partnerships. Many, many of our partners are online today. Thank you for joining us. And we feel that our research and our science and technology efforts also contribute to sustainability and local ownership of this effort. So I mentioned at the beginning that 11 agencies came together to develop the global food security strategy. Um, these are the 11 agencies. As you can see, they span a wide range of interests and topics across the US government. Our strategy also identifies initial mechanisms for how we will coordinate at headquarters amongst these agencies and also at the regional and country level. The strategy maintains USAID's leadership role to coordinate the overall initiative, and it commits us to joint reporting, monitoring, evaluation, and learning. Having this broad range of US government partners also really helps us contribute to something which I think is essential to our overall success, which is the fact that the overall initiative, and in particular, our research and our science investments, bring benefits not just to the developing countries where we work, but back to the United States as well. And our next speaker, Rob Bertram, will speak to that a little bit more. But I think we've seen to date the many, many ways in which our research investments are bringing benefits back to US farmers, back to US companies, and back to US taxpayers. And I think that's a very important point that we shouldn't lose sight of as we go forward. I'm now going to hand off um, the mic to our chief scientist in the Bureau for Food Security, Rob Bertram. He, of course, was instrumental to development of the original Feed the Future research strategy, and will give you some additional context as to how the global food security strategy and our research investments relate to each other. Thank you very much.
afternoon and hello everyone. Um, Dr. Chapatin has laid out, I think, very clearly how the Global Food Security Act builds on a lot of the learning in uh, that took place during Feed the Future. So now what I would like to do with you is drill down a bit more on research and start by reviewing how we developed the research strategy for Feed the Future back in 2010 and 2011. And then I'd like to add a few updates and share some things that we've learned that I think pivot us forward to think about how we can uh, really align our research, food security research going forward to uh, deliver on the promise and the uh, urgent uh, outcomes envisioned in the Global Food Security Act of 2016. So this was basically a list of the major challenges that people were talking about uh, in the early part of this century and in 2008, for example. But what happened in 2008 was, uh, you may recall that uh, in 2007, 2008, global prices for food skyrocketed. And we had essentially a food price crisis that catapulted food and agriculture back onto center stage in the development community and as a global uh, concern. And uh, this basically uh, led to some urgent responses and then some longer term responses by the United States government. So st starting in 2008, President Bush put through an emergency appropriation which was passed by the Congress to restart and restart the reinvestment in agriculture and food security as part of our global development agenda. And this was followed in 2009 with a G8 agreement to put $22 billion on the table amongst the G8 donors over three years to combat uh, undernutrition and extreme poverty. And the U.S. contribution to that was Feed the Future, which with a $3.5 billion commitment over three years. And as you can see, uh, Sahara Moon has already talked about uh, many of these aspects of Feed the Future that have been continued uh, in the, uh, the work of the, under the Global Food Security Act. So let's take a minute and talk about why agriculture-led growth was, was the way forward. Agricultural growth is the most effective in reducing poverty. It drives demand for locally produced goods and services. And this demand, these opportunities are often opportunities that the poor are very well. Thanks, everyone. So in this slide, what we see is that agricultural growth not only increases, increases employment opportunities for the poor, it increases both the availability and affordability of food. And in the lower right of the slide, you'll note that the productivity growth, particularly in staples, pulses, and oil seeds, leads to increased caloric consumption among the poor. Although we also see that other agricultural growth, for example, in livestock and horticulture, are also significant, uh, significantly increased caloric consumption. And we'll say a bit more later about why non-staple foods are also uh, critically important. Next slide, please. So just a reminder here of what Feed the Future does. Um, I wanted to highlight the middle, the third bullet, which is the role of science, technology, and innovation through research and development. Um, and overall, as Sahara Moon made clear, we have had a dual focus on reducing extreme poverty and reducing child stunting. These are our topmost objectives. And now, with the Global Food Security Act, we have added for resilience uh, a, a goal of reducing hunger, thinking in terms of hunger being a factor that could lead to, uh, for example, people becoming refugees if they really have no food to eat. So this is the marker that we're using along with our extreme poverty and stunting goals. Next slide, please. So what we did was, first of all, look at where uh, hunger, I mean, I'm sorry, where po extreme poverty and child stunting was located. And you can note in this 
map the hot spots in South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, Central America, and Haiti. And while this it measures the numbers of people, if we were to look at the depth of poverty, in other words, extreme poverty, we would see Sub-Saharan Africa even brighter in terms of red because of the depth of poverty in that region. Next. And then looking at child stunting, we see uh, a little bit, this, this slide is a little bit misleading. The light green is actually 30 to 40 percent stunting. So you can see that the burden of child stunting, which is a marker for chronic undernutrition and, and affecting everything from a child's growth to the economic outcome and, 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 and uh, cognitive development of that individual in, in his or her lifespan. So you can see again that Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia are the hot spots with again uh, some, something of a hot spot also in Central America. Next. So we overlapped poverty and undernutrition and considered a range of opportunities that spanned cutting edge research in public and private sector labs here in the United States to the development of, of crop varieties with, that were productive and resilient uh, as, as part of a strategy on global public goods where the private sector would not invest, for example, in crops like wheat and rice and, and pulses. And we also looked at tailoring solutions to the needs of smallholder farmers, the households, and their communities. And we looked, as we everywhere in Feed the Future, we had three cross-cutting themes. Uh, environment and, and natural resource management, uh, gender, and climate. And the strategy that came out of this, next slide please, was necessarily at a, a very high level, because as we discussed earlier, this was for the whole of the government, and uh, as you can see, three research themes emerged. Advancing productivity, which is, I think, traditional in terms of how we think of agricultural research. Um, enhancing food, uh, nutrition and food safety, which I think reflected the fact that we really wanted to focus on that outcome. And then to really take this to the level of reducing poverty, uh, to do this in the context of transforming the systems that hundreds of millions of smallholder farmers uh, depend upon. And we found that hunger and poverty, extreme poverty, were concentrated in four major agricultural regions, and you can see them here on the slide. Uh, these were densely populated, uh, strongly agrarian areas, and sometimes it's counterintuitive that this would be the same place where hunger and extreme poverty are located, but that's indeed the case. And just as for the Global Food Security uh, Act, the strategy um, will laid forward these, these overarching objectives, and we'll, our strategy, I think, that we developed this time will do the same. But I think it would be helpful to all of us as we think about this uh, and the entries to this strategy to look at our program focus. And this gives you a sense for how USAID organized its research programs under the Feed the Future research strategy. We had three long-term programs listed at the top. Uh, many of these programs were important conduits for leveraging and sharing the best of US science in our universities, in USDA, and in our private sector, alongside uh, bringing benefits back to US agriculture in terms of, for example, livestock diseases that we're not facing yet, or, or crop diseases that haven't reached our shores. So we, this is an example of that win-win aspect of agricultural research that Dr. Chapleton mentioned. Um, <clears throat> All of these, then we had three at the bottom of the slide, uh, medium-term programs and things like policy, capacity building, and nutritious and safe foods, trying to improve the quality of the diet. And all six of those programs come together in the seventh program, which is that program for sustainable intensification of systems. This is where we're talking about leveraging technologies, natural resource management, the policy and market context, the human capital context, 
to really find ways to transform smallholder systems that will lead to the poverty and undernutrition outcomes that we are trying to uh, affect. Next slide. Now these are some of the criteria that we used in evaluating various research opportunities under the uh, program objectives. And as you can see, uh, uh, many of these, uh, for those who have thought about research, um, these will be the kinds of things that we have always been asking about. And we will continue to use these criteria going forward, I think. But for example, think about impact at scale, um, the relationship of a certain type of research to impacts on the poor or the vulnerable groups. I think our resilience focus in the new Global Food Security Act uh, puts added uh, weight on that area. The whole issue of risk and risk reduction, I think, is something we want to be thinking about. Again, uh, spanning resilience to productivity gains, but also to the human outcomes in terms of nutrition. We want to think about cost-benefit analysis, and we did, and we I think we'll continue to do so. And we'll think about the sustainability, uh, certainly in an environmental sense, but also in a socioeconomic and institutional uh, sense. And finally, I would note that I think all of us need to think about the impact pathways associated with the kinds of research investments that we could make that will drive the outcomes that will then achieve the vision of the Global Food Security Act. And in this case, we were trying to do this under the Feed the Future vision, which, as we know, was very similar. So bringing us up now to where we are for the next few days, talking about the uh, research under the Global Food Security Act, um, we are uh, using some of the same techniques we used in 2011, working with BIFAD to elicit input from the full range of partners, uh, from the NGO community to uh, public and private sector science in the United States to, uh, to partners around the world, and particularly in our, our, our national programs that are key collaborators in all of our work. So once again, we're asking you to, to come together and give us the benefit of your insights and your perspectives and help us uh, do the best job we can in terms of shaping uh, our research strategy and choices going forward. So now I'd like to take a minute and just update things for you. We can see that actually in the 20 years from the middle 90s to the early 90s to the early part of this decade, um, poverty and hunger are reducing. Uh, undernourishment has dropped significantly, although we'd like to see it drop even faster, especially in Africa. Uh, poverty is also declining, as you can see. Uh, unfortunately, Africa, again, seems to be lagging. It's the upper line, the red dashed line in the, in the upper right of the slide. And then finally, though, just to indicate how far we still have to go, the bottom chart shows you where we are in terms of micronutrient deficiencies. And this is very recent, just from 2015. And micronutrient deficiency is a marker for inadequate diet. And, and uh, you can see, again, Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia as the real hotspots for global food insecurity. Um, and I want to drive this last point home because while we are making progress, we still have over 3 million children a year uh, preventable deaths due to undernutrition. So the urgency that we face now, even the admit, in the midst of the progress that we've made, compels us forward. And I think it was this, this vision and the need and the urgency that really led to the huge support in the Congress for the Global Food Security Act in, uh, just last year. So let's talk a little bit about some of the technologies, the ways that we can think about research. Uh, certainly genetics, and this is not just in crops. We could think about livestock as well, uh, things like heat tolerance and drought tolerance. And as you can see, uh, this is the impact of a stress-tolerant maize varieties in just last year's El Nino in southern Africa. I believe this picture is from uh, Zambia. and and. The difference genetics can make is, is tremendous. 
So we want to keep that kind of advanced science and the public goods that, and private goods that can deliver it up, uppermost in our minds. But we've also know that, next slide please, that where you put the genetics matters greatly. We have learned that, uh, that the environment and the soil fertility and the management of the natural resources in the, and, and the crop rotations and so forth has a huge impact. This is some work from Dr. Sig Snap and partners in Malawi, some Malawian scientists, that shows uh, how uh, this doubled up legumes approach, this is a legumes cereal rotation with two legumes and, and then the maize, and it can lead to huge income gains, fertilizer efficiency gains. In fact, you can use half as much fertilizer. Um, uh, protein yield is much greater. The biomass yield is much greater. So a, a farmer would be better positioned, for example, to she might be able to uh, afford goats uh, and have feed for goats based on her higher biomass availability. And the yield piece there is a little bit deceiving. This is the yield based on the rotation. So it's actually you're actually doubling or tripling yield on the, at the annual level. It's just that you're planting maize every other year instead of every year in this rotation system. Anyway, I just wanted to flag this for you to, 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 to see how we connect uh, advanced science in ways we could say genetic traits, but then we put them into context on farm and, and think about how they are managed. And thinking further about resilience, Next slide, please. Uh, let's, next slide. Uh, okay, we just, we'll get that up, but I'll introduce it. We're going to talk about r resilience. Is, am I doing it here? No, you're good. Oh, okay. Okay, so, <laughs> um, it's not, it's, all right. Okay, it's fine. Uh, sorry, folks. So we also know that in many areas where we work, um, farmers are already fo facing difficult climatic challenges. And there's probably, I think, no biophysical factor more significant than water and rainfall and droughts and so forth to, to affect the resilience and productivity uh, and opportunities for communities. So what I'd like to show you here is a century of weather data that shows you what is actually uh, what farmers are facing. And what you can see is the trend line accounts for only about 5 to 10 percent of the globe of the variation over a century of data in the last hundred years. The decadal considerably more in terms of decade on decade change, but note that in the upper right 60 to 90 percent of the variation that farmers face is uh, is year on year. So we are already dealing with communities facing a challenging environment. And I think I, I wanted to highlight this because of our focus on resilience going forward. And I think we can take the next slide to drill down a bit further into a region where resilience is a huge topic. And this needs several more clicks. Uh, that shows you the variability, uh, again, with the interannual variation swamping even decadal and trend line variability. And so thinking about how to equip farmers and communities in the face of this climatic variability is not only essential to achieving our food security, nutrition, and hunger goals, hunger elimination goals now, but also to put them on the right pathway to, to be able to adapt to whatever climatic changes they face in the future. So now, the other big thing that we've talked about in terms of the Global Food Security Act is uh, uh, nutrition. And as Sahara Moon said, we have really elevated nutrition. So let's look at what, what we know that the Lancet study tells us that if we do everything right on nutrition, in terms of breastfeeding, uh, in terms of child care, and so forth, all the health interventions, we will only reduce nutrition by uh, stunting by 20%. Other sectors have to come into play. That's why in USAID and across the US government, we take a multi-sectoral approach to child, reducing child stunting. So I wanted to highlight here for you that food makes up about a third of the difference that is required, and that paler green is the non-staple foods, the animal source foods, the vegetables, et cetera. 
So it's both quantity and quality of food. And then it's both water and sanitation, making up about another third. And then I think very importantly, and sometimes surprisingly to people, women's status, uh, and especially their educational level, as represented by their educational level, has a huge bearing on the outcome of, of stunting reduction. So again, I wanted to flag all these factors for you so that we can think in a forward-looking way as we pivot from Feed the Future to the Global Food Security Act. And finally, let's come back to the uh, results framework that, that Dr. Chapitan uh, talked about in her talk. And it's, it's hard to read, and, but what I wanted to flag for you is a, a couple of key things. Uh, one is the, 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 the productivity growth on farm, uh, which uh, is one of the key messages that comes out of the literature review from Doctors Masters and Prey for the document they've uh, prepared is something that can drive many outcomes on the left side of that chart. And when we think about productivity, yes, we can talk about on-farm productivity, but market efficiency, market access efficiency, all of these add to productivity gains as well. So let's think holistically about that. Um, let's, as we talked about here, let's think about resilience in, in a holistic way that builds on agricultural outcomes, for example, through genetics, natural resource management, better information, uh, market access, po good policies, all of which can help reduce risk and foster investment. And, and one of the key aspects of reducing risk in a way that makes investment more attractive to a farmer herself, to a government in terms of building roads, for example, or to the private sector in terms of input and output markets investments, is, is, is this can lead to the capitalization of undercapitalized systems. Many of the smallholder systems where poverty, hunger, and undernutrition are concentrated suffer from an undercapitalization of agriculture. So we're trying to think about you know, what can we do that's going to make irrigation more tractable, mechanization more tractable, the wise use of water? And now with the health, the objective on the third side, having added water and sanitation, uh, as, as, as Dr. Chapman mentioned, um, we're also thinking about hygiene. So not only nutritious and safe foods, but also how do we handle horticulture and livestock in ways that are going to in ensure better outcomes in terms of hygiene and food safety. So finally, um, I'd like to ask you all as you think with us over these next three days to really think about what role research plays in, in delivering on the vision uh, in the Global Food Security Act and in that results framework. Not every pr problem is going to be solved by research. But we do really want to encourage all of you to share your thinking about how research can solve problems. And we need to think about sustained approaches. You know, research is generally a longer-term endeavor, and it's not something that we can start and stop in a, in a year or two. So again, we need to be very canny and strategic about how the strategy is developed and then what choices it suggests we take in implementing it. Um, so we look forward to hearing from all of you uh, as we develop this research strategy. And um, we're really grateful for the opportunity to work with the BIFAD again in engaging our global partners in, in helping advance our thinking and helping deliver for the American people on the, the vision of the Global Food Security Act. Thanks, everyone. And back to you, Julie. Thank you, Rob, and thanks to everyone who posted your comments and questions in the chat box. Uh, we encourage further questions. We'll have time to take a few questions in just a minute. But first, I wanted to quickly orient all of you to the Ag Exchange platform uh, very briefly, since the discussion will be getting underway momentarily. So you'll see on your screen right now, this is a screenshot of AgriLinks and uh, the Ag Exchange platform where the discussions will be taking place. 
So if you simply go to agrolinks.org and either log into your Agrolinks account, or if you don't have an Agrolinks account, uh, go ahead and create a new one up here in this top bar where it says join Agrolinks. And then uh, either through the front page, through your emails that you've received about this Ag Exchange, or through this events uh, tab right here at the top of the page, you'll be able to navigate to our Ag Exchange discussion page here today. And if you haven't yet joined, you can click over here on the right to join or register for the Ag Exchange itself. And um, starting uh, now, actually, the discussion threads should be getting posted on AgriLinks. You'll see over here we have uh, three different days, April 18th, 19th, and 20th. When you click on one of these uh, day tabs on the left, you will see a series of threaded discussions right here in the center of the page. And that's where you will put your comments, ask your questions, reply to others, and engage in the discussion. You can also view a list of uh, facilitators if you'd like, our list of recommended resources as pre-reading to the various discussion themes. Uh, you can see who all is participating or uh, check out the frequently asked questions for answering some of your questions you might have about how to participate. I also wanted to point out that uh, one of the features of the Ag Exchange is that by default it will email you for every comment uh, that is placed in the discussion. Some people really like this because you can actually reply to this discussion through your email. Uh, you can also monitor and see when, uh, when posts are being posted, see what's latest. But some people prefer to get those emails either as a digest once every three hours or not get those email notifications at all and only participate through the website. So I just wanted to point out that once you're logged into the Egg Exchange, on the right over here, uh, you will see some mail digest options and you can change your preference on what type of emails you would like to get. All right, so on your screen, uh, if you click on Ag Exchange or the agrolinks.org link, you will be able to navigate on over to the Ag Exchange. And if you have questions at any point, you can email agrolinks at agrolinks.org. All right. But in the meantime, uh, we would like to take a couple of questions from the participants. Oh, and also over on the left there, you can see um, the, uh, the, the useful links for um, navigating to some of our key resources. But we had a question come in um, from Chike Mba that I wanted to quickly address with you, Rob and Sahara Moon, um, which is that uh, he quoted a, a specific um, uh, publication that mentioned that it's estimated that the application of existing knowledge and technology can increase average yields two to threefold in many parts of Africa. And so with that in mind, uh, he's asking about the balance between an emphasis on getting research outputs to people that need them versus conducting more research. And how do you view that in light of our Ag Exchange today? Well, thanks, GK, for that important question. Uh, one of the things we do research on is policy. And policy, of course, leads to a lot of uh, behaviors in, in people as they act in response to what is uh, a policy environment, a market environment, the opportunities uh, for them. Uh, it, it's, while I think it's fair to say that the opportunities to apply technologies uh, are there, there's something still that's preventing that happening. And, and there have been, of course, many huge development investments over time, much larger than research investments, that have tried to do this. I think the answer is that we need to still innovate in our development investments. And our USAID missions and partners overseas are doing this through the value chain programs and, and, and many of the ways that they are trying to drive technology adoption across the agri-food system. But at the same time, I think in the research community, the need to continually stay ahead of, say, emerging pests and diseases, the need to take advantage of advances in genomics, the need to take advantage of new insights on policy or new ways of communicating to people about dietary choices and on-farm uh, management and so forth. All of these, I think, still require new solutions. Some of them are adaptive. 
Some of them are about figuring out how to leverage something that's known in a, in a low-risk, high-capital intensive environment and somehow adapt that into a higher-risk, low-capital intensive environment. So, uh, so I, I, I think we have to think of a connection but across all that, that where innovation spans all the way from our research investments into our development investments. Let me turn to Sahara Moon and see if she'd like to add anything. No, I think you did a great job, Rob. I think I agree with that. Thank you very much, Rob. Another question came in from Elizabeth Dunn with Impact LLC. And she asked if one of you could speak about when and how new ideas and ongoing R&D related to ag productivity are validated and verified in terms of their practical feasibility and acceptance by farmers. I think she just wants to know when that validation process occurs, how should we incorporate that into the discussion? Uh, this is Saharman. I think that's a very important step in the overall research pathway. And many of our programs are, of course, most are working collaboratively with institutions in the countries where we are trying to have impact. And through those collaborations, are able to validate and, and test new technologies, new ideas, new approaches with farmers in the field in realistic settings such that they can get real-time feedback, both in terms of how well the technologies are working, but also real-time feedback that helps to inform, inform the research design such that they are advancing technologies and approaches that will be most relevant um, to those end users, whether they're farmers or, or others in the value chain. Great, thank you. And one question I think is worth bringing up because I'm sure there will be a lot of discussion on genetics in this ag exchange discussion. Um, knowing that genetics may be an important move to save, save some hunger-stricken areas, what would you say to those who are concerned about GMOs, people who think they're evil? Should we be talking about genetics in this discussion? So genetics, I think, as, as the questioner noted, is incredibly important and will be essential to many of the challenges that Rob noted, whether it's related to weather, climate, diseases. Um, finding the right genetics in both plants and animals is essential. Um, as to how we access those genetics, there are a range of tools out there. There's conventional breeding. There's marker-assisted breeding. There's genetic engineering or GMOs. There's new approaches like genomic selection. And so our approach has been to find the right tool, the right technology for the right challenge. When it comes to GMOs specifically, I think it's helpful to think not so much about the technology as, as sort of one thing, but the, the many applications of genetic engineering. And so, for example, when you're bringing in resistance to a particular disease that you've been unable to develop resistance to through conventional breeding, that's a very appropriate approach in which to use genetic engineering. For example, cassava diseases are decimating cassava in, in Africa, and there are some very promising approaches through genetic engineering to bring resistance into those cassava plants. So I think it's helpful to step back from, frankly, a lot of the, um, the discourse around GMOs to really just think very carefully about each application, where it can be relevant, what any potential upsides or downsides to using the technology in that particular context are. And then I think it becomes, um, you, you have a much more meaningful conversation with folks who may have some concerns about using that technology. Great. And uh, lastly, I think we'll take one final question that had come in from Michelle Jennings, who wanted some clarification about developed country research investments dealing with cutting edge solutions. Um, and a development focus on the social sciences about adoption of known best practices, what guides those types of investments of resources? And just how does the developed country innovations um, relate to developing country applications for the purpose of this ag exchange? Thanks, Michelle, for that question. Um, yes, we think about leveraging science uh, from partners in the United States and elsewhere in the developed world across the spectrum, including in the social sciences. And I think, for example, particularly now with our elevation of resilience, a lot of issues around behaviors, around providing better information and conduits to provide people more choices, more information so they can make informed decisions, we will be leveraging social science in doing that. 
And social science also importantly, uh, and research in this area, plays an important role in reducing risk. You know, we can think about financial tools, we can think about other ways for trying to mitigate uh, household risks in ways that help stabilize communities. So I think the resilience uh, agenda that's emphasized under the Global Food Security Act offers some new opportunities and potentially helps us engage uh, important partners like civil society organizations more directly in, as partners in our research and in application and uptake of our research to bring them to the at-risk, vulnerable communities. Thank you, Rob. And uh, a big thank you to everyone who has helped make this Ag Exchange discussion possible and this opening webinar possible. And most importantly, thank you to you, our participants in the webinar and the discussion, uh, for bringing your perspectives, your comments, or questions. Um, you will help make this a very rich discussion over the next three days. So please do head on over to the Ag Exchange on AgriLinks. Uh, we'll, as Rob mentioned, we'll be starting off with the discussion on criteria for focusing research investments for the next few hours. Later today will be nutrition. Uh, tomorrow will be ag-led economic growth. And then on Thursday, resilience. And we'll actually be closing with a, an, a closing webinar uh, on Thursday afternoon uh, with the, the BIFAD team uh, deliberating on some of what they heard throughout the three days. And you've got your relevant files for download over there on the left of the webinar. So we'll go ahead and close this out. Thank you very much for participating. And